You are listening to Spriting on a Whim, podcast episode number 11. Warm greetings and welcome to another episode of Spriting on a Whim. Today we cover shading in a broad and basic stroke, a much requested aspect of legendary super warriors that people ask for advice on. Of course I can't cover everything in one episode as that would be too long. I'm going to do just as I did in the previous season. I'm going to take Tutman, shade him accordingly and inform you of the steps I took to do so. Eventually a supplement will be released that tackles more specific areas of shading such as muscles and various articles of clothing, but for now, if you just watch this episode, you should be in good stead shading-wise, if you need a few pointers to get you going. Before getting into the nitty-gritty, I just want to explain what LSWI2, or Second Incarnate, is and its purpose. From 2009 to now, I've labelled the way that I sprite Legendary Super Warriors Incarnate, mainly for the sake of ease and to give a clear distinction between it and the other LSW variations out there. Now while it is a project as such, it well and truly is simply the way that I choose to sprite by default, an extension of my own LSW skills and me applying my flavour to the original style. Second Incarnate is simply where I'm drawing the line in the sand to distinguish LSWY as it existed in the last three years from where it is now, because it's changed substantially from how it originally was, through careful refinement and constructive criticisms from both members new and old. Second Incarnate is still in its early phases, I guess, so there's some resistance to the stylistic changes I've made here and there, but I hope to refine it just as I have LSWY into something that many users see as an appealing way to sprite their legendary Super Warriors characters. Particularly, I wanted to make this Incarnate more sheet-friendly and a more faithful realisation of the original LSW so the edits made are conducive to me producing bare-bones sheets for characters. Eventually, I hope to sheet the original LSW cast, such that people can create their own characters and even characters from the show by Frankensteining them together, very much in the same way that Sonko Hiroto did. Essentially, it's meant to provide a solid basis for and to promote sheet making, and not just be an exercise in doing standing poses, as the original LSWI devolved into. With the preamble out of the way, let's get into the tutorial. First of all, it's helpful to have a completed, non-shaded sprite to work from. One that doesn't need improvements to its composition right off the bat in order to be a good sprite. As noted before, the specimen on hand is my old friend Tutman, lovingly revamped for the purpose of this episode. We begin the modifications with changing the facial structure. This involves changing the jawline so that the neck is more pronounced, and moving the eyes such that the sprite's left eye can be seen slightly. The eyes are also moved upwards a pixel to fit a nose in between the sprite's eye and mouth, which will be produced later with shading. All of these changes that I'm talking about are variation ones to do with LSWI2. You don't have to do these, but if you were to add in extra features such as the mouth and the nose, that's how I would suggest that you do it, by moving the eyes further apart and to basically shift them on the face. The ear is also moved up a pixel, so that it doesn't look like it's being projected at a dodgy angle out of the side of the head. While it may look odd right now, with the shading it will all come out looking right in the end. Now comes an important part, getting rid of the signature black LSW shading. Erase the black and replace it with the colour that you're deshading, remembering not to destroy the basic outline, excluding the feet. That's not too hard. What's harder is the slight refining that you need to do to the body once that's done, particularly to the legs. You see, when you remove the black shading, the area will look a lot puffier, so you're going to have to slim it down by a pixel or two to ensure that the body parts are going in sensible directions. For example, look at how the leg had to be edited so that it doesn't look so strangely bent. You'll also notice that as a personal choice, I've moved the white areas on the shoes from where they were before so that they look like soles. That's just a personal choice. Onto the shading. As I always say, colour the side furthest from the viewer in the second tone first, and then the areas that would be behind others, such as the neck, which would be behind the jaw. As for the face, there's no set way to do it, but I colour around the ear so that the shading brings out its shape more. 
I put in a bit of a shadow where the hair would possibly produce one, and I put a pixel where the mouth and nose will be, just so that there's a bit of a ridge between the nose and mouth like there is in real life. With the third tone, you can have your fun. The nose is put in, the mouth is recolored, and the jawline plus the ear is shaded too. This is a very key point. When you're shading, you have to think of the kind of shape that you want to produce. For example, on the darkest hand, I want to have a bit of a curve here so that his hand looks slightly cupped. The curve is given by the second tone and reinforced by the third tone. This is technically anti-aliasing because we could have achieved this effect using black shading, but this way the curve is smooth and the curvature is basically more believable than it would be with just black. The same goes for the lighter hand. This is the general shape that we want and it's realized by the contrast between the tones. Always consider the shape that you want to convey when shading and think of how the placement of a darker pixel could make that line smoother. With the trousers, I used the second tone to color the lower leg so that it looked like it was bent inwards and drew the pocket. Third tone was used to do the same on the other leg and to just highlight the bottom of the trousers which stick out slightly from the rest of the pants because the clothing gathers up there since the trousers are long. Looking at the sprite, I wanted to make the legs look just a bit longer and so I faked that effect by simply lowering the shading on the pants a pixel so that the thighs looked bigger. Shading the arm closest to us involves just using a few pixels to define the inner elbow and distinguishing the wrists from the hand. Go easy on the shading here because if you use too dark a shade on this side it looks very much like the outline itself. Basically anti-aliasing won't work too well with darker tones on the arm here so unless you're spriting muscles just stick to using two tones. To get the shirt right you need to heed what I said before. What shape do you want to realize? We want the shoulder to be distinguished from the chest, so we draw in a line with tone number 2 to do that. We want a slightly bold chest, so to get that, we darken the area just beneath the chest, but because the shirt is also creased, we have a few lighter pixels there, just to highlight that the shirt is not skin tight. The third tone can be used in place of some of the black shading seen before, and to accentuate the shape wanted, in this case the chest. I also just used a few pixels of darker grey on the chest symbol to show that it's still part of the same shirt and not just something hovering in front of the body. But I didn't use any more than two tones. If the third had been used then the symbol would be indistinguishable, so be very careful with shading designs on a shirt. If it becomes invisible or indistinguishable then use fewer tones. In fact you're better off using no tones if it means that you can actually see the design. Onto the hair, I use the darkest tone on the internal lines of the hair, and then fill in the bangs that are behind others using the second tone. This gives a sense that the hair is multi-layered and not just on one flat surface. Filling a few bangs on either side of the hair makes it stand out a lot more. Then you shade the inner parts of the hair by drawing a thinner version of the bang shape inside of the bang, and you join all of the hair pieces together near the roots using the second tone. You don't want the viewer to see the seams between where one bang ends and the other begins, and so you keep them hidden using that second tone. With just a few more refinements that are unimportant to discuss at any length, this is the final result. If you're able to reproduce anything that looks similar as a result of using this tutorial, then you should be damn proud. Pat yourself on the back for a job well done. Always remember that spriting doesn't stop once you've attained a skill. You have to nurture it time and again through doing more and more sprites till you're practically an aficionado in that area. And even at that point, you need to look at the parts where you're slightly weaker and then keep on improving through listening to people's criticisms and just generally doing lots of sprites. Doing what you enjoy. Hopefully, you're now more aware of some of the ins and outs of shading the way that I do for LSW, and I look forward to seeing the work that you produce. Take care, and happy spriting! This has been a Spriting on a Whim podcast by Angry Boy. If you wish to see more of my sprites and miscellaneous goods, head over to spritingonawim.net.tc where my extensive archive is located. If you want a large and thriving LSW community, head over to forum.dragonballvortex.com for top-notch LSW sprites that nowhere else on the net has.